Well, we're coming on to three o'clock now, so I guess I'll get started. And before anybody gets too upset by the title, don't worry, there will be lots of penguins in this talk as well. But I just wanted to show everybody that Antarctica is more than just penguins. And let's start with the funny little man in the orange suit. That is me. Um, you won't see my face on the screen today because it's impossible to share these pictures and me at the same time. So you get a couple of pictures of me at the start so you know who's talking. And that's me standing on a floating piece of ice next to one of the research ships that belongs to the British Antarctic Survey. And just so you can see what my face looks like better, that's me on a German research ship standing in front of a lot of sea ice in the Weddell Sea last year. And it was very cold then, it was probably about minus 20 degrees outside. So, just for some of my sponge expert friends out there, the big thing you can see in the middle of this picture is a sponge. And it's covered in all sorts of other life. And this is to help show you what I do for a job. My job is marine biology. That means I study the creatures that live in the sea. And in particular, I study all the creepy crawly things that live on the bottom of the sea. So some of these animals have no eyes, some have lots of eyes, some of them have no legs, others have lots of legs. And some of them stay still all their lives, like corals and sponges, and others swim around like fish. And hopefully, I'll be able to show you some of these things later on in the talk. But let's start with the basics. What is Antarctica and where is it? Antarctica is what we would consider in the Northern Hemisphere as being at the bottom of the world. It sits over the South Pole, and it's a continent so a big piece of land covered in ice. And you can see where it is. So this is the bottom. You can see my mouse pointing at the bottom of South America, the bottom of South Africa, the bottom of Australia, and the bottom of New Zealand. So Antarctica really is at the bottom of the world. And Antarctica is a very big place, but it doubles in size in winter when the sea around it freezes, because it's that cold that the seawater freezes. This is a picture made up of hundreds and hundreds of satellite images. Now these are pictures taken from space and they show you what Antarctica looks like. And you can see that it's mostly covered in ice. And there are just a few very small places where mountains and rocks stick out through that ice. And Antarctica is bigger than Europe, so it's a really, really big place. And because of that, there's lots of places in Antarctica that are very difficult to get to and have hardly been studied at all. But it's also a place that's being affected a lot by things like climate change. And all of that ice, if it melted, would push up sea levels quite a lot and change the way the world looks. So let's give you some Antarctic facts. Antarctica is an amazing place. And I bet most of you didn't know that it was the world's biggest desert. So Antarctica is the coldest, windiest, and remote, most remote continent on Earth. It also receives the least amount of rainfall or snowfall of any place in the world. It also holds the record for the lowest temperature ever recorded at the surface of the Earth, minus 89.2 degrees centigrade. I can't even imagine how cold that feels. All I know is that when it's about minus two outside, I'm already complaining. And the warmest temperature ever recorded in Antarctica, sadly, was 20.75 degrees centigrade on the 9th of February, 2020. And you might be thinking, if you're sitting at home, why was it warm in winter? But if you're living in the Northern Hemisphere, it's winter now. But in the Southern Hemisphere, it's summer. So that was the middle of the Antarctic summer. And as I said before, a tiny amount of Antarctica sticks out from under that ice. So less than half of 1% of the surface of Antarctica is free of ice and snow. That means if you're looking for rocks or fossils or anything like that, there's only very few places you can go to find them. And if you're a plant or an animal that lives on land, there's not many places to live. 
And that ice that's on top of Antarctica is called the ice sheet. And that ice sheet can be four kilometres thick in some places. So that's way taller than the tallest building and as high as the highest mountains. And there are some places where there are even mountains that we've never seen before because they're hidden under kilometres of ice. And just to show you what this ice looks like, here's a video taken by some of my colleagues and it shows you the West Antarctic ice sheet and some scientists working on it. Now you can see huge amounts of ice and the tips of some of those mountains sticking out and you can see how tiny the people are. And these are geologists who go there to collect rocks and they can learn how long the ice has been there and how thick the ice has been from collecting these rocks. And they can also tell you how old Antarctica is. And you can see their tiny little orange tents in the foreground is where they live, thousands of miles away from other people. And at the edges of Antarctica, that ice spills out into the ocean. And where there's huge chunks of ice floating, we call them ice shells. And ice shells are massive. The ship you can see in the picture is about 90 metres long. So that gives you an idea of how big that ice is. It's absolutely enormous. And that ice is where icebergs come from. So as those ice shells grow and float out further away from the land, they eventually break off and bits of it turn into icebergs. And those icebergs can be up to hundreds of miles across. And here's a big piece of ice that looks like it's sat on the land, but it's not. It's in a frozen sea. And that ice is stopping that big iceberg from moving around. But that sea ice, the frozen sea, starts off life as tiny little ice crystals that join together. And as they join together, they form these pancake ice. So you can see why they're called pancake ice, because they're flat and round. And eventually, just like in this picture, enough pancake ice forms that it starts to pile up on top of each other and eventually freezes together to form sea ice. And here's a picture of lots of different types of sea ice. So some of it is closely joined together and very thick, and other parts are very thin. And when we're going down to Antarctica, we have to navigate through the sea in the ships. And it's much better if you know where the thin bits are instead of getting stuck in the thick bits. And looking at one of those thick bits that's just been broken by a ship, you can see that there's layers in the ice. Now, where I'm pointing now, is the top of the sea ice, and that's covered in snow and fresh ice. And when you look through, there's a layer of that. That's probably, this, is, this sea ice is probably two or three years old and has been floating around. And as you go deeper and deeper, you can see the older sea ice. And some of it looks really dirty and brown. But that's not dirt. It's actually tiny plants and animals that live inside the sea ice. And that's very important because when that ice eventually melts, it will release those tiny plants into the sea. And that's like fertilising the oceans and releasing tiny plants that grow and grow and grow and feed everything else. So just to show you how thick sea ice can really be, this is a video from last year when I was on a German research ship. And we got stuck in the ice for pretty much three weeks. And we just went bash, bash, bash. And this is all speeded up because we're going a lot slower than this because you can't get enough speed up with that much distance. But as you can see, the ice around the ship starts to crack a little bit. But it took a long time to get out of there. And you can't see any open water around the ship. It's just ice for miles and miles and miles. So I work for the British Antarctic Survey. And that's an organisation that's dedicated to studying the polar regions. So we work mostly in the Antarctic, but sometimes in the Arctic and sometimes on the tops of high mountains. And we work in lots of places that are cold. So it's not the sort of place if you like it warm, but lots of people love the adventure and the science. Now, British Antarctic Survey is quite old. It started in World War II. That's back in 1943 and was known as Operation Tabri and was a top secret military operation. So the army 
but there wasn't much going on in Antarctica during World War II. So they quickly started to study scientific things down there, like the animals and the tiny plants and the things that live in, live in the sea, and particularly geology. So they were collecting rocks like those people I showed you in the video earlier. But these days, instead of camping, we also have five research stations. And we also have one in the Arctic, too. Now, research stations are buildings where people live and work. So some of them are science buildings, some of them are for generating electricity, and others are simply for living and sleeping in. And I'll show you some of our stations in a minute. British Antarctic Survey also has five aeroplanes. One big one and four smaller ones, and I'll explain them again soon. And we have one research ship, the James Clark Ross. But soon, that ship, which is over 20 years old, is going to be replaced by a brand new ship called the RRS Sir David Attenborough. Now, some of you might know of this because it was almost called Boaty McBoatface because of a big public vote. But now there's a little yellow submarine instead that goes inside the Sir David Attenborough that is called Boaty McBoatface. Now, these research stations, the five of them we have in Antarctica are spread out all around this area of Antarctica. So each red dot on here is a research station where people live and work. And I'll take you through them in a second. But this is how we get there. So you have to travel a long way to get from where I'm sitting in Cambridge to get all the way down to Antarctica at the other end of the world. And if you're going by plane, that takes you almost two days and if you're going by boat, it could take you three or four weeks. Now, what I do as a scientist is I fly all the way down either to the bottom of South America or to the Falkland Islands, then get on a ship to do my work. Other people will fly directly into Antarctica in a little plane, and some people will come in through South Africa when they're coming to do other work. And when you eventually get there, one of the first places most people get to is Rothera Research Station, which is our biggest research station. Now in this picture you can see Rothera. So this main set of buildings here are where people live and work. Down here is where the ship comes in. And this big grey bit down the middle is where the, where the aeroplanes land and take off. And the big building next to that is where we keep the aeroplanes and look after them. Now, this is a place where up to about 100 people normally live in summer, and then it'll go down to maybe 20 or so in winter. And we do have people there all the way through the winter, even when it's really, really cold and really, really dark. And this tower here is like you have at airports for the aircraft control, so we can see the planes coming and landing safely. This is another view of Rothera, and that's with the ship pulled in, and you can see that we have a big building here, and this is a building for science, it's a marine biology laboratory. And there's our scuba divers keep their boat in this shed and then they go out into the sea from here. And here's a picture of one of the planes that are taken off from Rothera. The next station is Halley Station. And Halley is a very new and exciting station. It was, a, it was designed by special architects to be a modular system, so each one of these can come apart, and when it needs to be moved, it can be dragged along on the skis that it has on its feet. And a couple of years ago, we had to move Halley because of a big crack that started coming in the floating ice shelf that it sits on. And so our team of people used big tractors and moved Halley all the way to a much safer position. And how did they do that? They used very big tractors and just pulled it along. It took a long time, but it was very exciting because when it was all set up again, everybody was safe and sound in a new, safe place. Halley does look like something from a science fiction film or a cartoon. And this is it with the southern lights, the Aurora Australis, behind it. The next station I'm going to show you is Sydney Research Station, which is on a little island just off the Antarctic Peninsula. This is a place where people study seals and penguins, and as you can see, there's a bit more green in the background here, so we have some bits of grass and some moss and things that will grow here, and some people study those too. 
and there are even lakes that have open water in summer, and so some people study what lives in the lakes. Then you go a bit further north, and we have two stations in the north, one on South Georgia, which is a big island, and South Georgia has a very long history of having people there, and in the last century, and the century before that, there used to be whaling stations on South Georgia, so this big rusty mess in the corner is where there was an old whaling station. But these new buildings down here where the ship is, is where our science station is. And they do a lot of work working with fishermen to make sure they catch the right amounts of fish and krill. And the last of our bases is the smallest of our bases. And that's Bird Island Research Station. And this is as big as it gets. And it's got maybe three or four people living there in winter. But it is an amazing place, and the whole island in summer is covered in seals and penguins and lots of types of bird. And these birds are what give the island its name because they come there to nest, including albatrosses and skewers and all sorts of beautiful birds. So as well as the bases on land, you can see that Antarctica is like a big island. And so you need to work in the sea if you're a marine biologist like me. So very often I work on big ships. And this is the James Clark Ross, our current ship. And as you can see, it's a very big ship, and it's able to break through the ice because of its special design. And it's also got lots of scientific equipment all over the ship, but can also be used to carry big containers, like you can see on here, that are used to carry food and supplies to the people on the station. Our new ship is even bigger. So it's it's nearly half as long again, and it's currently being built in Liverpool, and this is the Sir David Attenborough. And you can see that Sir David Attenborough himself and Princess Kate both um, named the ship earlier last year. And that should be ready soon for testing in the Arctic. And I mentioned planes earlier on. We've got two types of planes. This big red one here is called the Dash 7. Now that's a big plane and it can carry passengers and cargo. So it's a bit like a train or a bus. It carries people from place to place. And these smaller planes, which we've got four of, are the Twin Otters. And you can see that they've got wheels and skis on the bottom. That means they can land on the runway and they can land on snow. And these planes are a bit like taxis if the other one's a bit like a bus. So these ones take people to those amazing places out in the middle of nowhere so they can do their science. So the people you saw in the video at the start, they all came in on little planes like this. And these planes fly enormous distances. So the map on the left, this one here, shows the routes that our planes fly around Antarctica. And then if you look on the right hand side, that's the same distances put over Europe. So that's like going from Edinburgh to Turkey on some of these journeys. So these little planes have to stop in lots of places to refuel. And the big planes have to go and leave fuel for them there. It's not all big planes and big ships though. We do have to do things on small things. So our scuba divers go out every day to go and have a look at what's living in the sea. And they go out in these little boats, and these boats can also take you to some of the small islands. Some of the people in the film that you saw were going around on these things, which are called skidoos. And they're very good for moving one or two people around on the ice. And they've got skis at the front and special wheels like a tank at the back. And they can pull sledges with all the equipment in tents and things on. If you're moving bigger things, like these people are here, this is a snow cat. And they're a type of like a Land Rover or something for going on the snow. And they've got, again, wheels like a tank so they don't sink into the snow. And those are very good for moving equipment and people around the bases. And if you really need to move something big or push the snow out of the way or move one of those buildings at the Halley Station, you need a big tractor. But unlike the tractors we have in the other parts of the world, these don't have two wheels on either side. They have one big set of caterpillar tracks. Now, I've told you a lot about us living and working in Antarctica, but before we ever got there, and people have only known about Antarctica for about 200 years, for millions of years before that, there have been animals and plants living in Antarctica. 
Now, the life on the land, as I told you, less than 1% of Antarctica is free of ice. So there's not much space for life on land. So the life on land is very small. Most of Antarctica is white with ice, but a few bits are almost green. And those are places that have some tiny plants on them. And in this case, the biggest plant we have is the tussock grass, and that doesn't even get very far into Antarctica. It's mostly on the islands around Antarctica. But the other plants we find are mosses and liverworts, and something that's a bit like a plant, but is actually more like a plant and an animal living together, is a lichen. And we get those in some of the most cold and remote places as well. But they all grow incredibly slowly and could take thousands of years just to get to the size you see in this picture. And what's even more amazing, some of the frozen bits of moss that have been frozen for about maybe 10,000 years at the bottom of a moss pile have come back to life when we warm them up. And living in these tiny plants, there are tiny animals. So you might think that seals and penguins and things are the biggest land animals in Antarctica, but because they spend most of their lives swimming around in the sea, we actually don't really count them as land animals. So what we have as the biggest land animal is this thing on the right, which is a wingless midge. So like a tiny fly, but it doesn't even have wings. And the other animals that are really common in Antarctica are mites, springtails, and tardigrades, otherwise known as water bears. But that's it, pretty much. You might get thousands of these in one place, but thousands of them would probably fit on your fingernail. So there's not many big animals in Antarctica on the land. But when you get to the sea, that's where the exciting stuff happens. So this is a picture made up to show you what the different levels of life in the sea are, from the top of the sea right down to the bottom of the sea. And in the sea around Antarctica, there's estimated to be around 20,000 species, but nobody can be sure because we haven't looked everywhere yet. But we can start off with the species you probably know about, the animals that you've seen on nature documentary, like the penguins and the seals and the birds and the whales. So let's start with them. There's about 90 species of those. Let's start with some Antarctic penguin facts. So everybody loved a penguin, and I did promise you some penguins. Penguins are the most common bird in the Antarctic. They're not everywhere, but every time I go there, I see penguins. You might be surprised to know that there are more types of penguin that live outside of Antarctica than there are that live in Antarctica. In fact, there are 17 types of penguin in the world, and a lot of them live in South America, the Falkland Islands, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. And there are even some that live up in the Galapagos Islands. Only two species of penguin live and nest and breed on the Antarctic continent. And those are the emperor penguin and the Adelie penguin. Chinstrap penguins, gentoo penguins, macaroni penguins, all breed on the top of the Antarctic Peninsula, on the, on the islands around there. And king penguins, which a lot of you have seen on television, only breed in the warmer sub-Antarctic islands, so much further north. These are macaroni penguins, and they get their names from the fancy feathers above their eyes, and they're super cute, but quite stinky. This is the king penguin I was talking about. So the orange and black one is an adult, and this adult has come back to feed its baby, which is the rather grumpy-looking, fluffy brown one. And you can see all the other grumpy-looking, fluffy brown ones waiting for their parents to come back too. And what the penguins do is they nest in huge colonies called rookeries. And then they come back and find their baby out of all of those babies and give it its food and then go back out again to find some more food for it. And talking of food for baby penguins, here's a gentleman feeding its baby and they have to regurgitate so it's a bit like being sick all the food that they've caught and spit it out to the baby and I'll show you that video again 
Because at the end, you can see what happens when that food comes out the other end of the Gen 2 penguin. And Gen 2 penguins are a bit antisocial, and if their neighbours get too close, they can shoot their poo at their neighbours. This is a chinstrap penguin. Now, chinstraps get their name from the little feather pattern underneath their chin. It looks like a strap, maybe on a military helmet or something like that. And these are the biggest of all living penguins, the emperor penguin. Now, if you imagine some of the fossil penguins that died about 30 million years ago were twice the size of an emperor penguin, and that emperor penguin comes up to about my middle, so it's very tall, then you can imagine that the fossil ones are even bigger. And emperor penguins are amazing because they nest on the ice, so they lay their egg and scoop it up on their feet so it never touches the ice to keep it from freezing. And then when the chick hatches, they have to do the same with the chick. And they have a special flap where they can hide the egg and the chick and keep it warm. And that's what their chicks look like. They're super cute, grey and fluffy, and look like something from the Happy Feet cartoon. I've never seen them on Sing or Dance, but they are adorable. And many people think that penguins don't have very long necks. But actually, from this, you can see from the skeleton on the right-hand side, that actually penguins have got very long necks. They're just hidden inside a very fat body. And that's not because penguins are lazy. That's because penguins need to stay warm because the water they're swimming around in is about minus two degrees centigrade. And it only doesn't freeze because it's got so much salt in it. So the penguins stay warm with their special feathers and they stay dry because they keep their feathers oily. And lots of penguins, when they change their feathers, have to sit around for a week until they've got their new feathers before they're allowed back in the water. But that fat that they build up also helps keep them warm. And then on to my favourite penguins. So these are Adelie penguins. These penguins are not scared of anything. Well, almost, almost. They are willing to take on birds and predators much bigger than themselves. They're not afraid of human beings. I had one follow me on a beach for about an hour to find out where I was going. And if I walked too fast, it screamed at me to stop. Their eyesight isn't that great on the land. They're much better at seeing things underwater. It's a bit like when we go swimming. If we open our eyes underwater, we see blurry. They see blurry a bit on the land. So he probably thought I was another penguin. Now, this video here, I'm about to start is from when I was on a ship last year, and I said they weren't afraid of anything, but even penguins are afraid of a really big ship going past. So this is them running away from the ship that I was on. And you can see them swimming through the water, and then now they're all gonna start jumping out onto the ice on the other side. Boing, 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 boing. Now look out for the one on the right-hand side, which goes the wrong way, and all of his friends have gone left. There he goes. Don't worry, he went back to his friends later. Now, as well as penguins, a lot of the animals that we see in Antarctica are seals. Now, seals live all over the world, but Antarctic ones have to have a pretty tough life. And there are six species of Antarctic seals, leopard seals, Ross seals, Weddell seals, crab eater seals, fur seals, and elephant seals. And you'll see why they got their names in a minute. Elephant seals can swim and dive down to 2,388 metres. And that's the deepest one we've recorded so far. That's so deep down that if we were down there, we'd be squashed and we certainly wouldn't be able to breathe. And they can stay down for a very long time. The leopard seal is the only Antarctic seal that eats other seals. They're a really big, scary seal. They also eat penguins, fish, and krill. And if they can catch them, they'll even eat seabirds sitting on the water. Weddell seals are very cute. But they have to use their teeth to keep holes open in the sea ice where they live so that they can get in and out of the water to hunt, and also then they don't suffocate and get stuck under the water. Now this animal is the leopard seal. And you can see by its big teeth 
that it is a predator. But it also will eat very small things like krill. This is a Ross seal. And Ross seals spend most of their lives on the ice, but will sometimes come onto land. And the same with Weddell seals. You'll sometimes see them on the beaches. Fur seals you'll mostly see on the beaches or swimming out of the open ocean or on little tiny bits of floating ice. They don't go too far into the ice. But they are amazing because their fur is very, very soft and they were hunted by humans almost to extinction over 100 years ago. But a few of them survived on South Georgia and now there are millions of them again. But one thing I would say is don't get in the way of an angry fur seal because they bite. And this monster is a fully grown male elephant seal. Now elephant seals are enormous and they can weigh as much as a small car. They're very heavy, very fat, but as I said, they can dive very deep. And the males have this huge nose and they like to fight each other to see who can be king of the beach. These on the video, are young female elephant seals and they are quite sensibly staying away from the male. Now they like to burp and fart to scare off anything that comes too close. So moving on from stinky seals to whales. Now I told you that the biggest animals on land were actually tiny, tiny creatures. The biggest animals in the sea is the biggest animal that's ever lived. And at least 15 species of whales spend time in Antarctic waters. And the blue whale, like I said, is the largest animal on Earth. It's absolutely enormous. We also have a lot of killer whales in Antarctica. It's one of the main places you can find them. And you can have up to maybe 160,000 orca living around Antarctica in the sea ice. Some whales don't hunt like killer whales, and instead they use big fibrous plates instead of teeth, and they use it to sieve out food from their giant mouths. And one of those is the blue whale, and that's a picture of a blue whale, and that's the biggest whale. The second biggest whale is a fin whale, and on the left you can see the fin of a fin whale, and just small in the picture is a whale poo. So that's the second biggest whale doing the second biggest poo in the world. And that poo is a pinky red colour because they've been eating krill. And this is the tail of a humpback whale. Now humpback whales are making a recovery in Antarctica after they were almost hunted to extinction as well. And here is a humpback whale that came to visit our ship last year when I was on it. And the humpback whales are drawn to sit, they're very curious and come and have a look at ships and they like to hear the noise of the engines and things. And this one sat there for about five or ten minutes having a look at us. She was swimming around. It was a lovely sunny day. And it gave us plenty of time to take nice pictures and video like this. And actually humpback whales sing to each other underwater and so, um, their songs can travel hundreds and hundreds of miles. And this one was just getting ready to do a deep dive. And you know that because now when he goes over, he lifts his tail up. And you know when the tail's going up, that's it. He's going down deep. And what we did after that was swim underneath the ship. And we didn't see him again because they can hold their breath for a very long time. We also have the killer whales that I talked about. And there are different types of killer whales in Antarctica. Different families of killer whales eat different things. Some eat fish and squid, some eat seals, some eat penguins, and others will even hunt the biggest of the whales, like the blue whales and the fin whales that I was talking about. They're like the wolves of the sea. And one of the smallest filter feeding whales is the minke whale. And I really like minke whales because they live a lot of the time in the sea ice. So even when there's no other life around, we get these amazing whales popping up next to the ship. And here's a video of them racing our ship through the ice. It can move really fast on a windy day. It's quite cold to be outside, but it was very beautiful to see whales that close. And even 
even scientists like me, who've been to Antarctica lots of times, get very excited when you see whales like that. So moving on from whales to birds, and these are the birds that aren't penguins, so these are the ones that can fly. The wandering albatross has a wingspan of three metres and weighs up to 12 kilograms. That's a very big bird for a flying bird, and it in fact has the longest wingspan of any flying bird. Most species of albatross only lay one egg each season. So if you think about the birds in your garden, most of them lay three or four eggs and have to feed lots of hungry babies. But albatrosses, they will spend a long time looking after one baby. And there are four species of albatross that breed at South Georgia. So Bird Island is very busy with lots of birds. And the South Polar Skewer, which is a predatory bird, which eats lots of other birds and things, is the world's most southerly bird and has even been spotted at the South Pole. And given that they're quite greedy, it was probably looking for a free lunch because I'd been chased by one that wanted to see if I had any food on me. And when scientists go anywhere near their nests for doing research, we have to be very careful because they'll dive bomb us and peck our heads. So this is a wandering albatross pair and there, just underneath, you can see a baby and they build these mounds and nest on them. And this is a black browed albatross, a bit smaller, it's only about two meters across, and it's got this amazing black eyebrow. Gray headed albatrosses are very beautiful, and there's some of that tussock grass that I was talking about before. And then the light mantled sooty albatross, which looks like he's had his head in some coal. And here's the skewer that I was talking about, and this is one that is dive bombing the scientist that was taking the picture. And another big predatory bird, so one that hunts, is the northern, southern giant petrel. And it's a huge bird and quite scary looking, and it will even attack penguins and steal their eggs and babies. And this tiny little thing is an arctic tern. And you might think I've got it wrong because I'm talking about Antarctica. But actually, arctic terns do the longest migration of any bird in the world or any animal in the world. And they will fly from the North Pole to the South Pole and back again every year. They only like to live in summer. So like I told you earlier, when it's summer in the Antarctic, it's winter in the Arctic. So the bird swaps around and is always living in summer. And this beautiful bird that looks a bit like a dove is in fact a snow petrel. And snow petrels are one of the birds I like the most when I'm in Antarctica, because when you're in the ice, you you get to see these beautiful birds flying past. Now, all of the life in the sea is dependent on the plankton that grows at the surface. And in that plankton, there's about 700 species of animals and tiny plants. But the one I want to talk about today is krill. And there are billions of krill in the ocean. And they help keep the whole ocean healthy and feed all the other animals. So all of those things, the birds, the seals, the whales, the penguins, all like to eat krill or eat things that eat krill. Now you might wonder how that can feed the rest of the ocean. So at the surface, there's tiny plants that are growing in the water. Those same ones that were in the ice. And if you look the krill eat those tiny plants, and then the krill get eaten by the penguins and things. But the krill also are pooing, and their poo sinks to the bottom of the sea, and there's still some nutrients left in that poo. So the krill are actually feeding all of the weird and wonderful animals that live on the bottom of the sea. And that's where we're going next. So the bottom of the sea is the stuff that I study, and it's full of some very strange creatures. And there's nearly 19,000 species living at the bottom of the sea, and we keep finding new ones all the time. Some things you might recognise, like the big starfish in this picture. Now, these big red starfish are a bit like the ones you might get around the UK or other countries. But these ones can live at minus two degrees centigrade, and they don't like it if you warm it up. And the yellow things, in the picture that look a bit like lemons are actually called sea lemons but they're nothing to do with lemons other than the colour they're actually a type of snail 
And before anybody says they look more like a slug, they've actually got a shell, but it's inside their bodies. This picture is full of things that you might not recognise. So as well as our starfish and a bit of a sea urchin at the top, there's things like hydroids and bryozoans, which are colonies of animals a bit like corals. There's this thing here, which is a sea cucumber. And these things here that look a bit like clams are in fact called brachiopods. And they've got a similar design to a clam, but they're millions and millions of years older. So these things originated from before the dinosaurs. And here's a little cheeky shrimp. And just to show you how big some of these things are, here's one of our divers scuba diving near Rothera. And you can see big sponges and soft corals. And this pink colour here is actually a type of seaweed that grows on the rock. This fish is called an ice fish. And ice fish are amazing because not only do they live in water that's very, very cold, they haven't got any red blood cells because they don't need them. Because the water is so cold that more oxygen can stay in the water. So instead of wasting lots of energy making red blood cells they don't need, they just got rid of them. But instead, they have special proteins in their blood that work as antifreeze to stop them freezing up at minus two degrees. This creature here, don't panic, it's not a land spider, it's a sea spider. And sea spiders aren't the same as the spiders we get on land. They're a completely different group of animals. And in the background, you can see these little limpets as well, which are grazing on that pink seaweed that I told you about. And here, for the people who love sponges, is a giant Antarctic sponge, and they can get even bigger than this. Some of the sponges are bigger than that diver, and they can live for thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. And you can also see all the other beautiful life behind. Now, there's lots and lots of animals in Antarctica, and some of them are related to things you might know. So if you've ever been to the beach and turned over a piece of seaweed, you might have seen sandhoppers, the little things bouncing about. Some people call them sand fleas. And these are different types of sandhoppers that live under the water in Antarctica. And these are brittle stars. Now, brittle stars are related to starfish and sea cucumbers and other echinoderms. And it, the one in the middle is even called a basket star because its arms branch out until it makes this basket shape. These are different types of corals and anemones and even a jellyfish that you get in Antarctica. So there's hard corals and soft corals and sea pens. And here are some amazing things. These are sea cucumbers. So the one in the middle, the big pink one, it's about as long as your arm. And some of the other ones, like this little one down the bottom, live on a single sea urchin spine. So they're very tiny. And this one in the middle, I'm going to let my friend Mel McKenzie from Australia explain what that one is. Hi, I'm Mel McKenzie uh, from Museum Victoria, and I'm here on Soantico Cruise of the South Orkneys. I'm here as a sea cucumber expert, a holothroid expert, and one of my favourite sea cucumbers is a guy that we just pulled up from 750 metres down. I'm going to show you him now. This, my friends, is a sea pig. Isn't he gorgeous? <laughs> and what I love about sea pigs, these kinds of sea cucumbers, is they're like little vacuum cleaners. You can see here, they use those tentacles to just vacuum up the sea floor. And they also have these gorgeous little feet that they use to move along extremely slowly. So make sure you have a look at one of these guys on the internet because they're amazing. Oh, thank you, Mel. And Mel filmed that in a snowstorm, so she's very brave. Here's something you might all recognize, starfish. And the one in the middle, the really big one, is also a type of starfish, but it has 50 arms instead of the normal five. And instead of crawling around like a lot of the other ones, looking for muddy food on the bottom of the sea or hunting for things, this one waves its arms in the air and can actually catch krill as they're swimming past. And now back to the sea spiders. Now, some of you might be able to count the legs on these sea spiders, and some of them have got eight legs like land spiders have, and some of them have got up to 12 legs. 
and they're amazing and they get to about the size of a dinner plate some of them and here is a video for anyone who's not squeamish of the sea spiders from one of our expeditions whilst they were still alive crawling around in a bucket and you can see it looks a bit like spaghetti because there are hundreds and hundreds of them in there all different shapes and sizes and every little leg looks like another bit of pasta these animals are called isopods and isopods are related to the wood lice in your garden and we have lots of them in antarctica including giant ones so this one glyptonotus antarctica is a giant isopod and is bigger than your mummy or daddy's hand it's a really big one we also have some very fancy worms so all of these are worms we've got scale worms and we've got some other ones that live inside the mud so this one will crawl around on top of the mud some of these others will live in the mud and speaking of things that live in the mud some of these clams and mollusks will also be in the mud we also get octopus in Antarctica from very small ones a couple of centimeters across right up to ones about half a meter across and we also get more of these types of sea lemons that I told you about before as well as normal limpets and snails and this is a real sea slug so this one doesn't have a shell and same with this one now we have so many species in Antarctica that when we go there somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of the species that we pick up from the bottom of the sea are new to science so I've been very lucky if you can call it lucky to have ugly creatures like this named after you but these are two types of sea cucumber that Mel Mackenzie that you saw in the video and her colleagues in Australia named them after me so there's one with a hue and one with the Griffiths and I know it could have been prettier things but they're still special to me and now I'm going to show you all of these animals where they belong at the bottom of the sea so this is a video that takes you all the way down to the bottom of the sea hundreds of meters down and you can see giant sponges corals this is a sea squirt with one of those isopods living on it here's a fish living inside a sponge trying to sneak up on some krill does he get one? Oh no it escaped and here we have an octopus a giant sea spider in the background and a one of those ice fish with a special blood swimming past these are sponges probably about a meter or two tall with giant brittle stars on them and then these things here are called feather stars now feather stars are normally sat down on the bottom but if they're disturbed they swim like these ones and they look a bit like ghosts or aliens and in this patch well, everything that is in front of you is massive so so the big sea anemone here is probably about half a meter to a meter across so if you think of the anemones that you see in the rock pools that's really big and these are all giant sponges and some of these are called potato sponges and other wonderful names so that's where i'm going to stop telling you about the creatures that live in antarctica and just show you one picture of some of the animals I saw just in one trip just to tell you that although Antarctica is a big white place and like I said it's a bit like a desert in the ocean it's amazing and there's loads of life that you can see even without going to the bottom of the sea but we also have a lot of fun when we're there although science is very serious and we're looking at some important issues like climate change and other things like that actually we have an amazing time in Antarctica and it's a real privilege to get to go there and that's why I think it's important to come back and share this with all of you at home. So hopefully some of you will grow up and come and do what I do and go to one of the most exciting places in the world. But whatever you do, don't be as naughty as me and throw snowballs at people taking a picture of you. Thank you very, very much for tuning in. I can't believe how many of you have watched this from the start to the end. And I really appreciate it. Now, this will be recorded so if any of you want to watch it back or share it with your friends you'll be able to click on the link and see it again but thank you so much for tuning in and if you've got any questions i know you couldn't talk to me live now but you can send me questions to my twitter or to the facebook event page which goes with this broadcast and i'll try and answer as many as i can and it would also be amazing if some of you could draw pictures 
or write stories about going to Antarctica or some of the animals you've seen and then I can get to see them on the internet if your parents help you put it up. Thank you very much. And if your parents or you want to find out some more things, there's the Discovering Antarctica website, which has got loads of Antarctic facts in it. There's the Bass website. And there's also the Polar Museum website, which is an amazing place when you've all allowed out again, can come and visit the museum in Cambridge if you can. Anyway, thanks again. And I hope you all had a really nice time. Bye bye.